For the past several weeks that I've been writing this TED Talk, I've been obsessed with one year, 1995. Now, there are many good reasons to like the 90s, right? The economy was booming, Bill Clinton was playing his saxophone, which I'm a jazz fan, I love that. Um, and, you know, Michael Jackson was moonwalking his way into fame. But there's two events in particular in 1995 that make it such a special year. Because in February of that year, Carl Sagan would publish The Demon Haunted World. Now, the Carl Sagan was already known as a scientist and a science educator, and the book itself deals with many of the themes that he encountered throughout his career. But perhaps the most famous lines of that book don't have to deal with Sagan's career, but rather with his predictions of the future. As Sagan wrote, I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when, clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide, almost without noticing, back into superstition and darkness. Sagan committed his whole career, his life's work, to science education, and yet even he feared that the dumping down of America would doom us to misinformation. Sagan died in 1996. He never got to know if his predictions were right, but that passage there it represents the core thesis of his science education career, that a society that, that neglects the intellectual development of its citizenry sows the seeds of misinformation. And when you put it like that, well, you can't help but agree, right? Just look, at, at, for example, at the Flat Earth Movement. In the 1990s, scientists like Sagan helped put an end to the movement. It declined to a number of merely a few hundred members at most. But nowadays, it feels like everyone's believing in a conspiracy theory, right? So what happened? This is a graph of the percentage of the population using the internet by year. See that blue line right there? That's North America. That's exponential growth. And that exponential growth, it begins in 1995. The internet really did expand these misinformation movements. It really give, did give them access to new populations to exploit. But I think more interestingly, it also gave us access to the everyday workings of these communities. Because if you look at their videos, if you go into their communities, if you talk to the skeptics, one thing becomes surprisingly clear, that their cognitive faculties, which Sagan cared so much about, actually aren't in decline. And look, their conclusions, they're absurd. But they do understand the facts as presented to them by scientists. They just reject them outright. And, you know, they would say, they're skeptics. You shouldn't take a claim at face value. And sure, that makes sense. And they try to test their theories. And they try to conduct experiments. And frankly, you shouldn't take a claim on, on the surface, right? You should only believe it once you're given incontrovertible proof that it's true. And when you say it like that, it makes sense. But how many of you guys in the audience have actually gone out and verified the curvature of the Earth? Sagan did get one thing right. It really is getting harder to tell the difference between what feels good and what's true. But I'm not sure we can chalk it up to ignorance anymore. I think it's high time that we ask better questions about science. What does it mean to believe in science? How do we know what we know? And most importantly, how do we create a sense of reality that we can all agree on? <sighs> OK, those, those are some big questions. So let's start where we can all agree. The Earth is round. But when I asked all of you guys in the audience if anyone verified it experimentally, no one really raised their hand. And look, that's OK. That's why we have scientists to verify it for us. But that also means that scientists have an inordinate influence on what we believe to be true. In other words, they have what is known as epistemic authority. Epistemic authority. Epistemic means relating to truth, to knowledge, to what we believe. And authority is just another word for power. Epistemic authority. Power over what we believe and what we know. Epistemic authority is not a bad thing. We really do need people we can look to for answers when we need them. But we should also be careful about conflating epistemic authority and scientific truth, because they are not the same. And that distinction is very important. Perhaps the best example of this would be Sweden's response to the pandemic. When a, when a researcher 
and a journalist from The New Yorker came to Sweden in order to review the public health policies that were being implemented there. She's quickly accused and attacked for being anti-science. In fact, when she went to public places, bars, restaurants, parks, she was accused of not believing in the science. The catch? It was because she was wearing a mask. But the Swedes had a, actually a good reason for this. The head of their pandemic response was Dr. Anders Tegnell. Now, he personally was doubtful of the efficacy of masks, bolstered by the public health communication departments and by the full force of the government support. His way of thinking quickly became the accepted, correct, scientific way of approaching the pandemic. If there was any expert you could trust, it would be Dr. Tegnell. He fought Ebola in the, Cong in the Congo. He served as an infectious disease expert for the European Union. But he was wrong. The, S the Swedish government later sent out a commission confirming that his strategy was largely ineffective. But at least Dr. Tegnell really believed in the welfare of the common people. Because remember, epistemic authority is power, and it can be shaped to anyone's interest, malevolent or otherwise. Let's take another example. America's response to HIV, or rather, I should say, the lack thereof, because there was none, at least for the first few years. But scientists actually studying it on the ground could very easily see that there was a threat, that HIV posed a serious problem. But the government didn't do anything, and in fact, actively muzzled scientists. By 1983, Ronald Reagan would finally publicly acknowledge the threat faced, that was faced in HIV. But by then, HIV had become an epidemic. This monument, known as the AIDS Names Quilt Project, is dedicated to all those who died from HIV during the 80s epidemic. But yet, in some way, it's also a monument to the difference between scientific authority, epistemic authority, and scientific truth. Because they're not the same. Epistemic authority is about power. It's about how we decide to run our society. But scientific truth, that's about logic. It's about reason, it's about evidence. So epistemic authority is flawed. What does that say about misinformation? Well, I'd argue that it actually matters a lot, because misinformation, I believe, we should see not as simple ignorance, a simple inability to understand the facts, but rather as a rejection of epistemic authority. After all, like Dr. Tegnell, experts get it wrong, and they use their epistemic authority in bad ways. So doesn't it kind of follow that maybe the burden of finding the truth should fall on the shoulders of the common people? This attitude, surprisingly, I found best expressed in an interview given by MP Michael Gove to Sky News on the issue of Brexit. I well, think the people in this country have had enough of experts with uh, organizations experts. from acronyms people of this saying, have had saying enough of experts. with, with, with organizations with acronyms saying that they know what is best and getting people, it consistently wrong. It the people have had enough of experts. Now look, Michael Gove is a politician, an elected one at that. He is fully aware of the arguments being made on both sides, the facts being deployed by the Leave and Remain campaigns. But his anti-expert attitude isn't, therefore, being driven by ignorance. It's being driven by fear, fear of elitism, of corruption, and even of just plain incompetence. And that's true for anti-science as well. Studies into the personalities of conspiracy theorists routinely find that they have higher levels of skepticism, and higher levels of distrust, but never any cognitive deficit. And sometimes this skepticism is actually warranted. The black American community in America has consistently had lower levels of trust in biomedical research, in public health, and in vaccination. And this is all because of a culture of fear and distrust. But that culture of fear and distrust is in large part the result of public health's greatest and most infamous ethical failing, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Between 1932 and 1972, scientists infected 400 black men with syphilis without their knowledge and without their consent. 100 died. Even to this day, trust in biomedical research and in vaccination remains remarkably low in black communities around America. Yet, when this scientific skepticism, however warranted it might be, becomes ingrained in a community, it, it can become very hard to root out. Let's think about the pandemic again. How many of the adults and parents in this room 
did rigorous, rigorous research to confirm what safety protocols they were going to embrace. I know you guys did a lot of work, a lot of reading, and for that, I can't envy you. But the truth is, we're as much influenced by the way other people act as, as we do in our own beliefs. In other words, if people take the pandemic seriously around us, then we trust them, because we trust people who are like us and people who are around us. This is a phenomenon known as social proof. In 1963, two psychologists, Viv Latne and John Darley, attempted to quantify this phenomenon. They put participants in a room with a door nearby, and smoke would billow into the room. Now, for most people, this meant there is a fire in the other room. Please leave. And 75% did. But then the psychologists put two completely silent actors into the room. And when the smoke started to billow in, they told the actors not to react, just to sit there silently doing the activity that had been assigned to them. And in that scenario, the fires were reacted to a mere 10% of the time. In other words, the participants, the actual participants, had intuition and reason to believe that they were in mortal danger, and yet they trusted the instincts of two people that they had never talked to and didn't do anything. Social proof, it should work for most of, our for most of the time, but it can also lead us down into misinformation rabbit holes. We're left with a dilemma, right? Epistemic authority is clearly flawed, but at the same time, we need that expertise. We need epistemic authority. Because when we reject that expertise, when we embrace misinformation, that has deadly, serious consequences. Even though the black American community may be justified in being wary of public health, lowered vaccination rates have actual effects. I think we need a new tactic. I think we need to embrace a strategy of science communication that brings actual experts back into the communities that need to hear it the most. Black doctors during the COVID-19 pandemic have been performing community outreach in order to lower vaccine hesitancy in their communities. And it's working. By bringing experts who have actual intimate and genuine connections to the communities they serve, we're beginning to turn the tide against misinformation. But some communities, they're really built around misinformation, and sometimes outreach doesn't work. Research at the Berkman Klein Lab at Harvard shows, for example, how social media can entrench us in certain narratives. Specifically, this is referring to political misinformation. To the left, you can see a bunch of blue nodes. Those represent generally left-leaning po political publications. And to the right, you can see uh, red nodes. That, that represents conservative-leaning publications. And the connections between them that form that giant web, those are all social media interactions. There's a very clear cleft and divide between the two sides. And, and regardless of your political affiliations, it's very clear from this graph that social media can feed us into information silos, can bring us into media enclaves that prevent us from having alternative sources of, inf of information. And that can be a driver of misinformation. For example, YouTube recently found out they had a flat earth community on their own platform. Now, they were exploiting the suggested videos algorithm in order to funnel people into the flat earth community. And remember, social proof works. If you surround someone in a community long enough, they'll begin to adopt the ideology of that community. So YouTube just simply changed their algorithm. They included videos from experts into the algorithm every so often just to kick you out of the community long enough and just to bring epistemic authority back into the conversation. And it worked. Within two years, the flat earth community collapsed. It didn't totally work out. Some of the flat earthers left to different platforms. Other flat earthers just changed the conspiracy they believed in, and then they came back on YouTube. These methods don't work all the time. Really, they aren't bulletproof. There's one more thing we could try. Because there's, there will always be this tension between epistemic authority and skepticism. But maybe we need to change things at the level of the individual. According to a study by Pew in 2019, 79% of Americans believe we don't trust each other enough. Now, that must speak to something in the soul and spirit of this nation. I believe that we need to have courage. Have courage to believe that misinformation isn't about who knows what or who doesn't know what. I think we need to have the courage to trust in people, even if we may disagree with them, because we know that their intentions are genuine. Because that 79% figure is something we all need to reckon with. Perhaps it's quite serendipitous that this talk should occur right before Thanksgiving. I know a lot of us are looking forward to Thursday, um, but I also know a lot of us 
will encounter misinformation at the dinner table. That one uncle, right? <laughs> and when that one uncle stands up and starts to spout something off, resist for a moment. Resist the urge to call them out. Resist for a moment the urge to throw evidence at their face. Resist the urge to call them some uninformed troglodyte that... Because it won't work. As Professor of Psychology Joven Byford notes, the best way to counter misinformation isn't evidence. It's sympathy and acknowledgement of skepticism. Because as we already demonstrated, epistemic authority is not the same thing as the facts. And you're right to be skeptical of epistemic authority too, because it can go wrong. It's also quite serendipitous that this talk should occur at a conference all about transcending boundaries. Because that's what this is all about, right? Boundaries. Boundaries between scientific authority and skepticism. Between governments and the people. Between individuals and communities. And we need to know that those boundaries, they'll always exist. But it's only by changing ourselves at the level of the individual that we, we can begin to write the difference in our lives. I can't agree with Carl Sagan anymore. And, you know, he worried so much about our cognitive decline. But is that really true? We live in a moment now where we have more information at our fingertips than we have had for generations, and really all of human history. The American public now are more informed than they have ever been. We're not too dumb. Our cognitive faculties have not declined. But we do have to be smart about the way we want to have a better society, or what society we want to make. Are we willing to accept that epistemic authority is flawed, and that believing in the science isn't as correct as we may initially assume? Are we willing to accept that skepticism is real and will always exist, and that misinformation is a result of us not acknowledging that skepticism? In other words, are we willing to be humble in the knowledge that we do not know much? Simply, are we willing to see this as a unity problem? Because that's what it is. It's not an intellectual problem. It's not an educational problem. It's an us problem. It's a unity problem. And if you're ready to see it that way, then I am as well. Thank you.